I was just in Montreal for five days. I've been a couple of times before to play at the jazz festival as a musician, but this time I went to cover the festival for WBGO Radio and for my podcast. The Montreal Jazz Festival started in 1980 and it grew into one of the largest jazz gatherings in the world. In fact, they boast that they're ranked as the world's largest by Guinness World Records. It takes place over the course of 10 days across 20 stages, many of them outdoors and open to the public. Hundreds of concerts, thousands of fried potatoes, too, because Montreal is, of course, the home of poutine, that dish you don't want to tell your doctor about. After a two-year slowdown because of COVID, the Montreal Jazz Festival came back this year, and it was my assignment to find the story, or multiple stories, follow a thread and tease it until it revealed a larger fabric of the event. I was free-range. You know, when you're a musician, the job is actually pretty clear. You get to the gig, you play the gig, you pack up and go to the next gig. But what does a journalist do in this situation? I was given a credential badge to wear with the word journaliste written on it and total access across the festival to find the story. Welcome to the third story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Pretty quickly, a narrative started to reveal itself. I mean, several narratives, really, and classics, all of them. The story of young versus old, the story about past versus the present, and ultimately the story of today's community of musicians, what's on their mind as they travel, what I started to think of as the Silk Road of Rhythm, which is the summer international jazz festival circuit from Montreal to Marciac, from North Sea to Umbria and beyond. I turned on my recorder and I hit the streets, but I didn't even have to leave the building before I found a thread to pull on. In the lobby of my hotel, I found one of the more revealing scenes of the event. Two large groups, each in town for their own gathering, were trying to check in at the same time. To my left was a gaggle of teenage girls who had come to town for the North American Irish Folk Dancing Competition, which took place at a convention center nearby. To my right, the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, including Wynton Marsalis, was just off the bus from Ottawa. The girls were all giggles and enthusiastic, nervous with anticipation. The jazz musicians were like Navy SEALs, dressed in track suits and sneakers with suit bags over their shoulders. It was like the difference between a team and a tribe. I decided to talk to the Irish folk dancers and let Winton and the band get some rest. Excuse me, I know you're not here for the jazz festival, but I was wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions because it's very interesting to me that you have the intersection of the Irish, North American Irish dancing competition with the jazz festival. It really is, yes. What is it like for you? I'm sure you've spent all year or your whole life preparing for this and you land here and there's these two things happening at the same time. It's kind of funny. Like, I don't... We didn't know this. the jazz festival was happening, so... Do you... Have any interest in the music that's going on or the festivities? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think um, it's great. I'm, we heard them performing last night as we walked back from practice yeah, was, last night. That was pretty cool. I'm mostly tired. <laughs> Have you ever danced to um, jazz music? Typically, if you dance to something, it like has a steady beat and stuff. Yeah. And I don't know enough about jazz. To know if it has that. Yeah. Enjoy. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> cool. Next, I found some folks who had come to the festival on purpose for the healing it provided. What's your name? Kenya Thompson, Shawanda Steed. Where are you from? We're from Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. And did you come here for the festival? We, we did. came specifically for the festival. Have you been to the festival before? I came in 2019. That was my first time, and I wanted to come back. And this is my first time, and I'm excited to be here. Well, welcome. Are you jazz fans in general? I like jazz, even though I'm not well-versed in who the performers are but I like it. <laughs> but this is a great place to come and get you know, some new information. I completely agree, yes. I find this to be challenging for people who have FOMO, fear of missing out, because you're always feeling like there's another thing that you could get to. This gives you the opportunity to break it and walk away, and you, you won't miss anything. You'll hear something else. You can go, go see something else. Something you discover cool. someone new that you haven't yeah. seen before, even heard of before, so you're and, not really missing out. You're to always like, catch something that you're going to enjoy and love. And this is laid out so well. Like I can see people who were who were in wheelchairs, who pa parents with carriages. They can get up to the stage. It's access. I love how the parks are open. This is so well planned. I love it. What I like about this experience is it, it's so community and just welcoming. And music warms everybody's heart. You know. Lastly, I really like that there's a 
a variety of artists here. And it's really great to see a lot more black artists being advertised and showcased because I feel as if people forget about that, yeah. What about COVID? I am fully vaccinated and boost, had the booster shot. Um, most people around me, I don't know what they have or haven't had. I think I have to take a chance. Yeah. My mom died from COVID. And what I've learned is, this is before they had vaccines. I, you still gotta live your best life and try to take care of yourself, but don't hold back on things, just be mindful. You see, everybody has a story. And my new friends from Boston were no exception. I mean, there it was, you have to live your best life. The festival is about the music, sure, but like music itself, the news is often in the space between the notes rather than the notes themselves. What made this space in Montreal so special? I have an old friend living in Montreal with her husband, Crin and Chris. He's a real estate developer. She's a circus performer. Close enough to jazz, I figured, to get some backstory. Crin, can you tell me when you moved to Montreal and why you moved here? So I'm... Um, a circus performer. I'd been living in San Francisco and yeah, I came here in 2003 and then I got the show with um, Cirque El Waz and I worked with that company for four years. I worked with a bunch of other companies and then I started to make my own work and I almost left and then I fell in love with the Canadian and that sealed the deal and I stayed. <laughs> so I became a Canadian in 2000 and. 19, so it took me a while. It's hard to leave your home, even for a place that has great benefits. And for me as an artist, it has been incredible to be here. I mean, I had maternity pay as a circus performer. Hmm. I was, I mean, like, right, we're laughing. Like, it just sounds insane. But like, by just filing my taxes in Canada, I was able to get maternity benefits for 52 weeks as a self employed circus artist. I mean, that changed my life as a working mom in circus. I mean, because the first half of my career, I was single. And then the second half, I was tour mom. And that allowed me to get back on stage. It changed everything for me that I don't think I would have been able to have such a long career in circus if I hadn't been living in Canada. You know, Canada really sees that, you know, this, this very interesting, diverse, outrageous world of Canadian art has become a key export for Canada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a smaller country compared to the U.S. I think that's a big thing. So there's definitely like a pride, but also, a, you know, as it is a, a cultural export of this, this mm -hmm. country. But in Quebec, it's different, too, because Quebec has such a strong European influence, as you know, with the, the connections here with France. So that's why I think circus really took root in Quebec, you know, you have this this tradition of small, very interdisciplinary, heavily into music, heavily into art, circuses. And so that really took root here. And then there's just this whole world that feeds on itself. And people are really used to seeing shows. Like mm -hmm. people go out. People see a lot of circus. They see a lot of music. They see a lot of dance because they become habituated to it. It's this like spiraling thing where you just get used to having Lots of live performance, lots of free stuff, and you just, you know, it's kind of become summer, and then you just, that's what you do every summer, and you just keep going and going. And there's a ton of government support for it. I mean, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, sure, there's, you know, corporate sponsors for the Jazz Fest. You know, of course, the Jazz Fest is huge, but something has to be the Jazz Fest. Right. You know, there has to be a marquee festival in, like, a festival city, and Montreal is really made, like, the summer is just jam-packed, right? Like, it's all summer long. There's something every single weekend doesn't stop. Montreal views itself as a, a city of culture and design. They have made it like a real core economic principle of like the center of the city is to say it's about culture and design. But for a long time, it was really only in the center of the city. But there actually has been a big effort to bring the cultural investments that come with these big festivals out into the neighborhoods of the city. So like in the past few years, a lot of the funding has been tied to having the big events also have offshoots in all the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So like in the neighborhood we live in, which is Verdun, it's uh, one of the old neighborhoods west of downtown, there will be circus, there will be jazz, there will be things in the neighborhood so that it's not, because sometimes there's a perception that the, the big festivals, they're only for outsiders. outsiders. And so there's been a big effort to also spread it outside, outside of just the downtown core. But it is a real core economic development strategy of the city because it builds off of a, already the strength that Montreal's always been a city of artists. A city of artists and culture, and they call it in French, le métropole. It's like the metropolis of Quebec. And so it's the core of like the cultural core of the, 
of the nation, the Nation du Québec, and they this is where the money goes to help support the culture because there's an island of Quebec of 8 million people in 350 million people in North America who don't speak French. And so there's like a desire to keep some, the thing that's special about Montreal special. Is there a, a low-key argument being made here that this is its own cultural refuge? This is not only Canada, but this is Quebec that's doing this, that it's Montreal, that this isn't... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, this oh, is, time. This is oh, not yeah. Canada. This is yeah. Quebec. Yeah. This is Montreal. And the cultural experience of Montreal and Quebec is pretty distinct from the rest of Canada. This is not a Canada thing. It's a Quebec-Montreal thing. It's very unique. You mentioned earlier that the real estate market had been undervalued for a while, like, but and that recently it kind of caught up. But why do you think it, w it was so slow compared to the rest of Canada? Well, for a long time, there was the a big economic depression that happened because K Montreal was the economic industrial heartland of Canada until a certain time in the 1960s. And then it, that went into a steep decline as like that era of industry kind of declined and most of the industrial heartland moved west in Canada. So the city went into a long economic decline that only really started to come out of in the 90s. So from the like si mid 60s to the 1990s, it, Montreal was in a uh, sort of an economic doldrums, but it's part of what helped to foster the creative arts culture here because it kept real estate prices very affordable for a Rent very was long time. cheap. Really cheap for a very long time. The city of Montreal and the province of Quebec are proud of the arts and supportive of the people's creativity, as opposed to being frightened of it, as so often happens down here in the States. And trusting the people turns out to be good business for the community. Community and creativity go together. But what goes into creating that creative space? For that, I went to speak with one of the organizers of the Montreal Jazz Festival. But first I had to learn how to say his name. Laurent Sounier. Laurent Sounier. Yep. As I walk around the festival, yep. it, you know, I'm struck by the amount of organization and planning that goes into something like this. You know, And, and as a matter of fact, I find myself trying to unlock some hidden messages in the schedule you know like there are different paths through the festival yeah. depending on what you want to see and exact yeah how is it approached there's many different answers to your question first where when we're planning the programming of, a, of the festival we're thinking both vertical in a day and also horizontal because we're working on different series on different venues so there's those two axes uh, that are kind of important for us. We are also planning the outdoor concerts, not exactly like the indoor concerts. We're trying to have less competition as possible in the indoor side of it. On the outdoor side, there are so many people that there could be competition and it's not that important. The idea is we're working first on jazz with a big J concerts. For us, it's the most important thing. And we're trying, if you want to see, I don't know, um, Aldi Miola, we're trying to uh, put him on the same time than Marcus Miller, for example, because in our mind, could be the same audience that could go to both concerts. We know that jazz lovers are not only into jazz. But it's difficult. We, we are uh, we are programming 350 concerts or something like that in 10 days. So there is always competition between concerts. But uh, I think that's the, the that's the fun part of a festival. This famous FOMO. Yes, the FOMO. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's why I feel like the way a festival goer processes the festival says as much about them as it does about the music. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, the, the, the FOMO for, for us is something very important. Yeah. <laughs> because if you still have that after 10 days of festival, you'll come back next year. Interesting. So you try <laughs> to foment the FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> if it's possible, yes, maybe. <laughs> Can you talk about the relationship between what is offered to you and what you seek out? Because I can tell that there's a part of what is programmed here that is intentional for the Montreal Jazz yes. Festival. First of all, you have a lot of local yes. artists. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and then there's also a portion of it that is part of this great sort of jazz migration that moves, I can tell, across Canada and now is leaving from Canada yeah. to go to Europe now exactly. for the festivals. Yeah. Yeah. How, how are you balancing those two? We're trying each and every year to have some really unique concerts. Uh, the Invitation uh, series, for example, we did three concerts with uh, Mackay and McRaven. We will do three with uh, Terry Lynn Carrington. Those are unique to, to Montreal. For a festival, I think it's important to have some new things, some exclusivity, uh, things that you cannot see anywhere else in another festival. The local scene is very important to us also and we're trying with the uh, with musicians with local musicians to do something special the idea is not only about celebrating things from the past but also thinking about the future are you booking for next year right now yes <laughs> <laughs> absolutely sure. absolutely yeah laurent mentioned the series of concerts by makai mcraven if i was looking for a story to reveal itself to me here then Micaiah McRaven was here to tell it. In fact, not just Micaiah, but his whole cohort of Chicago cats, trumpeter Marquise Hill, who you hear behind me, vibraphonist and pianist too, Joel Ross, bassist Junius Paul and drummer Micaiah McRaven, spent the first handful of days at the festival performing with one another, making a case for their common conception. These musicians all walk and play with a similar swing. Hip hop and avant-garde meet in the middle with them. And they all share a similar sense of intent and intensity. Micaiah is a self-described beat scientist, a drummer and a drum programmer, a producer in both the old sense and the new sense. He generates and ideates projects, he composes and arranges, but he's also a beat making guy, adept at sampling, recording and mixing. He embraces technology, but he's not afraid to discard it sometimes too. I saw him perform the material from his project Deciphering the Message, which was originally a kind of remix record where Micaiah took source material from the Blue Note catalog and recomposed it, recording new elements on top, changing and rearranging the tunes into something original, like melting and resetting gold jewelry. It's as beautiful as the original, but updated. And in the process of metamorphosis, something slightly mysterious happens to the music. I met Micaiah the next morning over coffee to talk to him about it. Makai McRaven, man, I saw you play Deciphering the Message last night. Yeah. I could really feel the historical line between the past and the present. Like, mm. there's something happening in that music that is so in the tradition. It's like the lineage is there, you know, but it's so contemporary and so now at the same time. Some of it is just the way we play, yes. you know, and, and, and how we hear the music and how we're interpreting it or how we're choosing to. I mean, there's moments we could decide to move more acoustic or more this way or that way or more conversational versus more loopy or vamp-based or like uh, rhythm, rhythm forward. And, but because of our shared aesthetics and understanding of what the music we're playing is, it's part of the way that we play and being musicians now of this era with our influences and the cohort of people that I like to bring together, shared uh, vocabulary. It is akin to the, the Blue Note era and a band like Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. You know, you listen to all these cast records who are coming through that band and there's shared vocabulary, there's shared approaches, there's similar intros and outros or the same outros or the, a new tune on the same changes. And it's, the, it's that kind of vocabulary, but this is where we are now. It's 2022, or 2020 as well. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, right. <laughs> and all the music that's around us is, is flowing through us. And you can choose to like when you want to express that or not, but I, you, couldn't, you can't find me a musician in the world that hasn't been influenced yeah. by rock and roll yeah. and pop music and electronic music and technology. And I mean, this is... It's just being present. When I was young, I came up and just in that time where it was like, it was like you gotta you gotta play this way or that way. Choose a lane. Like, yeah, and like there was an idea I felt like we had that was like if you played, we wanted to play jazz, but if you play jazz and you told people you play jazz, you didn't know you say goodbye to your career. You know, yeah, like yeah. you ain't gonna work because it's not cool. That was the narrative, and I that offended me always. 
you know, but I, I was affected by that too. It was like, I, and I was like, because the, the cats I grew up with, the elders, they were cool. They were not corny. They were not ch- cheesy cats. If anything, they're wild. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know what <laughs> you, you mean. You know what I mean? And I wanted to, like, you know, this idea that's like, we play jazz and then you're going to get put in a corner as this, like, old. Yeah corny square, some square yeah. thing and I was like I want to reappropriate that for myself I mean now I you know have my own feelings about the even the term jazz that that's a whole other conversation but like but but in terms of this idea it's like I want to reappropriate that for how I understand it in it and it's I think in how, how I feel it and what it means and but it was like a bad word you know you weren't supposed to be a, a, a jazz musician and so it was like it was a funny time to kind of navigate like you know um, and I think now I think now is a little different. I think now we have a, a new, a younger generation of musicians that have a little bit more space to, to define themselves the way they want. You know, you left it on the table. Sure. You, you know your feelings about the about the label. Yeah. About the word jazz. Well, well, one terms of genres are 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 always going to be limiting, and they serve a purpose for speaking about something that's abstract, right? And and they do and does and doesn't have strict borders, yes. right? So there's always going to be a gray area sure. between genres, time periods, anything, whether it's whatever genre we're yeah. talking about it. And then you have subgenres and sub subgenres, and 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 it's all trying to find a way to, it, with literal terms, talk about things that are abstract and are hard to define and hard to put into language, right? And so, jazz, when dealing with such a big and complex and conceptual kind of space, you know, within black music and everything. One way I think it was like jazz, the word jazz is at, at best terribly insufficient when describing the phenomenon, you know, we're dealing with. Because we, we could be talking about time period, we could be talking about idioms within in it, we could be talking about broad conceptual things. And then at, at worst, the word jazz is offensive, mm-hmm. you know, for many reasons from its origin and or how it's been used to pe- put people in boxes, if you know, racially. And, and so and it's just, it's a, yeah, it has a, you know, and, and if you look throughout history, guys like Miles, Mingus, Duke Ellington, the people who created this music all had their own issues with the words and, and you could hear different interviews, their perspective on why it didn't represent what they wanted to consider themselves you know because i look to them for answers then that's yes i believe that <laughs> you know i'm looking up to them as you, if you're going to tell me that you created this music and you're telling yeah. me like you know that you don't like to call it that then why would i say that other than me not using the word makes it difficult for us to have a conversation yes and so practically speaking Absolutely, I use the word. I yeah. want to reappropriate the word for yeah. how I feel and I understand it. But I will also acknowledge it's just, it's like I said, insufficient to describe what we're talking about. Yes. Jazz could be, it has a, has a saxophone solo. Yeah. Oh, I, you, you guys are like a jazz band. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. No, exactly. And in fact, I mean, I'm, I'm just so fascinated by the concept of jazz festivals. What makes this a jazz festival? Like, we're in Montreal right now, and if you look at the lineup, there's a lot of offerings. I mean, this festival in particular, a lot of people are playing here. It's mm. 10 days long. There's a lot of concerts. But, it, it, you know, on the same stage that Corinne Bailey Ray played last night, Kamasi Washington is going to play tonight. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's fitting in the same, you yeah. know. Yeah, but a lot of acts are going to be like... Uh, the, like not even like I saw one act I was walking by I'm not sure who it was but it was like it's like her and she's got like a DJ that's got like a drum pad oh, too Noga Ares. I'm like wow there's not even like an acoustic instrument on stage <laughs> it's like it's like we are yeah we're really she acknowledged it on stage too she said I grew up listening to jazz I tried to be a jazz vocalist at some point I was like all the others are so much better than me I really wanted to perform Montreal Jazz Festival because I heard so much about it. I'm here even though, you know, this is not really jazz, but... Someone's like, what does it all mean for the word? You know, in a lot of places these days, jazz festival means music festival. Yes. You know? I think it means musician festival in a way, you know? Well, that's what I think. When I think of jazz, too, I, I do think of 
musician music, you know, uh, you know, musician music in a way, like, you know, Duke, you're playing this, Duke Ellington wrote the music of Duke Ellington. Yeah, yes. You yes. know, this yes. is the music of Duke Ellington. Yes, the it's, music of Duke Ellington yeah, when he played, that's right. You know, and so calling my music this thing puts me in this, in this box that like is, you don't necessarily want to be in and and then you got to over explain yourself to like try to you know make sense make sense of it you know makai mccraven thank you for taking time thank you leo only a few years older than the irish folk dancers singer samara joy made her festival debut in montreal this year samara joy i loved you so since that first day Samara won the Sarah Vaughan International Jazz Vocal Competition when she was still a teenager and recorded her debut album during COVID while she also was finishing college. The record features guitar virtuoso Pasquale Grasso, who's also on tour with her now, as well as her mentor, drummer Kenny Washington. How, how do you feel right now? I feel like this is like a, a really hot moment it's for really you. really big. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Oh my gosh, thank you. And it's just, I don't know, I, this is the first like big festival that I've ever really performed at. Thank you. Um, and uh, we, we're on tour for two weeks, so it's like yeah. we're playing all of these club dates and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, a big festival like this. I haven't even really been to festivals like this before, so um, it's cool, you know. It's cool to be a part of in this way and have it be received pretty well since it's kind of like a small, intimate set, I guess, that yes. I, that I, and I, I kind of like those spaces better, but... So how did it feel for you translating into such a big space? I don't know. I do, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess I'm still learning. I want, I want it to, I want to do it better next time, but, you know, I think, I think it went over pretty well for I this I think time. you convinced them, yeah. You are 22 two years old yes. right now. 22. You just graduated from college last, last year. year. And I it doesn't even honestly, we graduated and then it was it was virtual. Yeah. I sang the, the, the anthem virtually. Yeah. Um, and I we got our diploma maybe like four months later. So it didn't really it was like graduation and then straight to work because yeah. we had already recorded the album and it had already been well it hadn't been released by that point, but we were getting ready, gearing up for like tour dates and stuff like that. While some of the artists I met in Montreal are just getting started, like Samara Joy. Others reached legendary status long ago and are still going. Maybe none more so than Dee Dee Bridgewater. Dee Dee is a multiple Grammy award-winning singer-songwriter. She's a Tony Award-winning stage actress, a broadcaster, an artist, an entertainer, an advocate. Ultimately, I think she transcends category or even description. She's a kind of an eminence. Dee Dee was in Montreal to perform a one-off duo show with pianist Bill Charlap. She was taking a break from a run of European tour dates with her regular working band. In fact, Europe has been a big part of her career. She lived in France for years, and she's a bona fide celebrity there. She's a star. Dee Dee welcomed me into her hotel suite to talk and revealed herself to be both a proud supporter of the new generation of singers and also a highly sensitive artist in a moment of real personal and professional transition. She began by showing me a letter that had been given to her the day before on her flight from Switzerland to Canada. Can I read this on the recording, sure. Dee Dee Bridgewater? Yeah. This is a card that was given to you on Swiss Air by the flight attendants. Thank you so much to be our guest today, Mrs. Didi. We wish you a very nice concert in Montreal and all the best for you. Take care. And they all signed it. They all signed it. What do you make of that? I mean, you're like a national treasure to them. It validates my existence. <laughs> <laughs> it validates all the years that, you know, I've, I've put into to my craft and... Um, it's interesting because mine is a very split life. I have my European life that the Americans don't know about. I have, you know, and then my American life, well, the French know about everything. So French people are always at my shows, but that most Americans have no clue about my European existence. You are maybe the greatest definition of a citizen of the world. You know, you have yeah. made the world your stage quite literally yeah you know leo i i had an opportunity to to go to france i was just met with open arms i was able to do a career in france without ever having to audition to prove myself about anything i just they would just offer me stuff you know had tv shows yes. radio shows obviously they love you and it's about you yeah but you also belong to a tradition of black artists who found a different 
level of reception, a different kind of respect, a, yeah. a different set of opportunities yeah. in Europe than yeah. what they were finding in the United States. Yes. I just attribute it to the love and the respect for jazz and its beginnings, where it really came from. I think that that is it. But there's always been a huge appreciation in Europe, and it's why so many African-American musicians, you know, found refuge there. I mean, still today, there are, you know, young musicians who, who are moving there. And when I run into them, they go, oh, I see. I see. I see. Did you see something else about yourself? Did you see yourself differently reflected in Europe than you had seen of yourself and your work in the States before you went I there? I just, what happened to me when I moved to France was that I was allowed to do whatever I had ever dreamed of doing. I mean, even my roles as an actress in television movies and um, and television series and just being on television shows. You know, there were a lot of, and still are, a lot of shows about music. But as, I don't know, I was the jazz artist. Well, I had a very big hit when I first got there with Ray Charles and this famous duet called Precious Thing. And because that became such a huge hit, I was catapulted to the level of all of the major prime time television shows that usually were not reserved for jazz artists. So I became a kind of anomaly, but also because I was an actress, I was asked to do skits and all kinds of stuff. And, and this was not only in France, it happened in Italy and Switzerland, um, you know, even um, as far as Israel. It, it was very surprising, but I don't know. They never questioned yeah. my abilities. I saw Samara Joy sing the other day. I was on. I was one of the judges. Yes, at the Saravon competition where she won. And I was thinking about knowing that you were one of the judges and thinking the context around being a young singer today, being a 19-year-old singer as she was when she entered, is so different from the context that you came through when you were 19. You know. Yeah. And I just wonder what you see when you see a young singer and think, well, what does this mean today versus what it meant? For for you back then? Oh, well, I don't compare. I don't think yeah. about what it meant. I just think about what it is for the young singer today. Jazz is a beautiful music in that people are always welcoming for the new kid on the block. Yeah. And each artist is in, an individual and so will not step on the toes of another artist. So um, I'm really happy for Samara and her career that she's been so wholeheartedly embraced. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's similar to watching Jasmia when she started, um, Cecile McLaurin Salvant when she started, even going back, you know, because now, you know, there's like a 20 year gap almost, Gretchen Parlato when she was starting. It's just been interesting to, 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 to watch the development of the music. I do appreciate that. Samara and uh, Jasmia and Cecile have brought it more back to a more traditional style where it is, you know, about telling the stories. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and I'm proud of yes. wanting to be as supportive as I can yes. of these young women. I appreciate the way you answered that. I mean, I, I wasn't implying that they're stepping on your toes in any way. Oh, more. no, no, no. I mean, like I said, there's a place for everyone. Yeah. I am concerned, though, since you said stepping on my toes. Yeah. I do have some concern because I'm in my early 70s about being pushed aside because of my age or not having the same relevance because of my age age. I feel in the jazz community that once a female, and usually she is a singer, and once the female gets to a certain age, you know, they're kind of, you know, pushed aside. I'm very aware of that. I'm very sensitive to that. I have tried to make my career be more about the music, be more about, well, 
it's also for me, it, you know, they're all, everyone's so curious about my, my image, my fashion sense and all of that. I'm just who I am, you know, and I've always loved clothes and always love putting stuff together. It's interesting and it's fun because for me, it's allowed me to go a lot of different places. Yeah. You know, when I go on stage and when I tour in Europe, well, my last tour that I did in, in Europe, I was just putting on some jeans and some hip shirts yeah. and jackets and some wild boots and hats and calling it a day. You know, so I like that there's this flexibility, but I, I'm kind of more with your generation and with the younger generations. When I see a jazz singer wearing a gown, I'm like, no, come on, no. Well, so that speaks again to this question of what does it mean to be a jazz singer coming up today? Because the material, like not only the the gown, like, well, who's wearing gowns today? So the audience might say, well, how does this relate to me? And the material also, some of the original canon is quite old, you know, and so you've got young singers who are are delivering lyrics and messages and songs that are, you know, coming up on 100 years old, some of these songs, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting moment to be It is an interesting moment, it. isn't it? it? It really is. Looking at these, the, just the singers who I've cited, you know, they've been very specific about their song choices so they have already a good sense of who they are and what they want to project in terms of of what they're doing musically I think that that is the thing it's just about how do you see yourself how do you want to brand yourself what is the image that you're trying to project these particular singers that that we've, we've discussed are very clear about their fashion sense for themselves you know their musical sense of who they are and um, are really standing by it. I would say probably the one who we will see move a little bit and may, there may be some shifting is uh, Samara yeah, because she's, she's the young. youngest and she's just starting, you know. But I love that these women have a good sense of themselves. Yes. So, so young, you know. I, for me, it, it wasn't really about that when I was their age. I was taken under the wings of all of these jazz greats, these male jazz greats. And so I just knew that I needed to dress a certain way. And, you know, I would just try to come to the gig looking good because I was with these, you know, I was with Dizzy Gillespie. I was with Sonny Rollins. I was with Dexter Gordon. I was with, you know, Pharaoh Saunders. I was with, you know, whoever. (laughs) I would always try to respect the image they were projecting so that I fit into that image and that situation. How was it to be a young woman among those men? Those were my fathers. Those were my musical fathers. I mean, I started out with the Thad Jones and Lewis Orchestra. Thad Jones was like my, my first dad and all the guys in the, in the band really looked out for me. And I think I was, it, was, it was a blessing for me, you know, to be born and to come into the professional jazz world with the sanction of, of all of these great men. Yes. And, you know, Sarah Vaughn acknowledged me and Nancy Wilson acknowledged me and Carmen McRae acknowledged me. And, you know, and then eventually, you know, I met Ella in the late 80s. It was beautiful. There was more, I feel, a more of a sense of of a family when I was coming up. And there was a lot of nurturing where you could go and sit in. And on a lot of big concerts, you know, you would go to the concert saying, ooh, I wonder who's gonna sit in, who's gonna show up, and you know. So we had a lot of that when I was coming along and that's kind of been lost today because, you know, we're in more of a me, me moment now. When I saw you earlier, I said, you know, you've got a busy schedule. And you said, well, it's not as busy as it was before COVID. And you're grateful for that. Yeah. But still, it's busy. And, you know, I mean, maybe it doesn't feel that busy to you. but I'm so happy because I have days off. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so crazy. It's not so crazy. So it's not physically or emotionally taxing to do it? Oh, Leo. Good. That's a good one. Yes. It's both physically and emotionally taxing. And normally I am with an emotional support service dog. And um, everybody knows my newest one. Her name is Daisy. But um, because the airfares were so expensive, 
for this tour. Uh, and because I'm going to two countries where I would have to get her special shots and it it's quite a process to go to these countries. Um, and because her airfares were more expensive, <laughs> I decided to, to leave her this time. And I'm also trying to work on myself mentally to be able to do the occasional tour without her because she really is my emotional support. And and I did a tour in Europe in April and I, I didn't take her because I was going to London and it was going to be a such thing a about process. Dogs in England, yeah. Uh, to get her in, I decided not to take her. And that was the first time I had never taken her with me. And I was a hot mess. Mm. So, you know, I had that run to now know, okay, do not react. Do not say that first thing. Don't write that email. Because um, she tempers me. She keeps me cool. You know, and my last dog was a, was a male. And he was great. You know, and because of him, I, I'm off of antidepressants. I was on antidepressants for 15 years, and my dog, Ayo was his name, you know, balanced me so much that I was able to get off antidepressants. So they're very important, and it's a real thing, and I'm not afraid to talk about it because people need to understand that depression is a real thing. I am clinically depressed. It means I'm going to be depressed all the time. I know how to deal with my depression now. I can recognize when I'm going into a depression and so I can kind of head it off or I can embrace it for that moment and let it be and ride it out. But because I put off this air of being very outgoing, mm -hmm. you know, people have always been shocked when I say I, I suffer from depression. Well, thank you for being open about it with yeah. me. I but I mean, I think it. that, you know, people need to be unafraid, you know, and um, and it's okay and it doesn't, well, I mean, maybe people will think differently of me. I really don't care. I'm at that point in my life where I really don't care what you think about me. I know who I am and how I am. And I know how to apologize if I have an aggressive moment because I'm not with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to acknowledge, as you say, that clinical depression is real and it's not necessarily related to your artistic world, but yeah. I also do sometimes wonder if having experienced some emotions so deeply, do you think maybe that has allowed you to to process those emotions through the music? I mean, do you think when you sing certain songs that you maybe have a, a more direct channel to it than, than oh, other yeah. people would? Oh, absolutely. I think this is kind of uh, bore fruit for me working with Bill mm -hmm. Charlap. Because it's just the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, mm, I listen to these stories that I'm telling mm -hmm. much more intently. And so they have a much deeper meaning to me now. And since it's just the two of us, um, I, there I find a sense of theatricality to them, you know, so that as I'm interpreting them, I can give them another kind of life because it is just the two of us. Yes. I see that Bill is not at all bothered mm -hmm. by me, by my incorporating the theatrics. And he said to me once, you know, Dee, Dee my mother was very theatrical. Yes. So this doesn't bother me. And my father was involved in Broadway shows. Yeah. So Dee, Dee be yourself. Yes. Be all of you. And that's beautiful. Well, <laughs> Dee Dee Bridgewater, I want to say thank you and I love you and you are an inspiration. <laughs> I don't know if this was what you anticipated, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> it's hard to describe the intensity of sharing an intimate moment like that with such an esteemed artist and a soulful person and then walking back out onto the street to rejoin the party on the Place de Festival. Irish folk dancers, poutine vendors, and the rest of it. But incredibly, the first person I ran into on the street was pianist Bill Charlap, who Dee Dee had just been talking about. So I asked him to tell me about working with her and about the art of accompaniment. Bill Charlap, I just talked to Dee Dee Bridgewater, and she was telling me about the theatricality and freedom when the two of you get together that it can kind of stretch in all these different directions and it takes on a different life. And she told me that one of the reasons it works with you is because you have such a deep 
familiarity with the theater and theatricality. Well, I understand um, what's going on mm-hmm. there, uh, the song, and really, uh, Dee Dee is a genius performer, an utterly brilliant musician, uh, a completely unique and effervescent <laughs> and dynamic storyteller, yeah. and one of the great risk takers in the music. So with all of that, and her time is perfect, mm. and her imagination is boundless. So how's that? With all of that, it makes it so easy for me. Um, there's trust. Yes. And that trust just seems to build exponentially every time we play together. So really, that's what it's about. And I think uh, that's why those two chemicals and yeah. all the different chemicals behind both of them yeah. work and make a, a sonic boom when they connect. You are also one of the world's greatest accompanists, not only for Didi, but for other singers as well. How do you lock in with the person that you're dealing with? What are you looking for and listening to? You know, it's really not different than playing with... uh, It's different because there are words, of course, and there are automatic stories and layers behind the story. So it's not always just one of those things can be uh, glib or it could be, it was the thing and I missed it. Mm -hmm. So it could be that with the words, but... If I'm playing with Phil Woods, or Benny Carter, or Clark Terry, or Jerry Mulligan, or Wynton Marsalis, or Dee Dee Bridgewater, or Tony Bennett, or my mother Sandy Stewart, or with Rini Rosnes, or with Kenny and Peter, it's all about listening to the psyche of the spirit of that person, and what do you want to do to contribute to that moment. Mm -hmm. It's not an original thing that I'm saying. I mean, any great musician in our music is thinking that way. Yes. You know, it's not about yourself. It's about how can yourself pair with somebody else to make something where the whole is greater than its parts. Mm -hmm. Another of the great masters when it comes to contributing to the moment and making a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts is bassist Scott Colley. I first ran into him at the festival my first day in Montreal when he was playing with Dave King and Julian Lodge. A few days later I found him again, this time playing with drummer Allison Miller's band. And I wondered how he pivots from project to project so quickly and so seamlessly. I saw you the other day with Julian Lodge and Dave King. I've been here the whole time. You left and you've come back. Where'd you go? Well, we did uh, six cities across uh, Canada with with Dave and, and uh, Julian. Su- super fun, yeah. amazing time. And uh, ended up here in Montreal, and then I went back to Ottawa uh, for the first concert with uh, Allison. And now this concert, and then tomorrow I go to Copenhagen with another project. Benjamin Koppel, Brian Blade, and myself, we have a trio. And so tomorrow we're going to, to um, do a version of it in Copenhagen. And then I'll be there for like five other concerts during the festival. So I know this is what your job is. I know particularly as a bass player, this is what, what it is. But, I mean, is there any adjustment that needs to be made when you jump from project to project, the aesthetics, the values, the kind of whatever, not just dealing with the music, but just kind of like figuring out what the sound is when you move from project to project? It's, it's really like a abandoning of preconceptions for sure. I mean, the difference between, you mentioned Julian's trio with Dave and this quartet with Allison and what I'm doing tomorrow. And so to me, those different... Uh, I've always been really interested in playing projects that are really diverse in that way, so that it and then there's different skills of mine, hopefully that I'm able to draw on over time. But the main thing is conceptually is like really abandoning to that feel. Like I'm really lucky to play with some amazing drummers, but they're all very, very different. Yeah. And they bring out certain things in my aesthetics and music as well. And then so it's just like trying to, get to that point where you have that trust and those relationships but it's it's a different set of parameters that you use you know whether how elastic something is how groove oriented it is and when and where to do these things and and uh it's like a lot of life it's like you you uh, surrender to a certain things but you try and gain more and more uh knowledge and information and and um the ability to 
be able to feel what's going on around you and not uh, get too stuck on what happened. What was good last night doesn't yeah. necessarily work tonight. Yes. That's a very important thing. It's like, are you really present or are you just sort of, you know, trying to replicate something that you did in the past? What's so interesting to me about that is that on the one hand, you talk about how over time you cultivate the skill set to be able to do that. And on the other hand, since you can't be attached to what happened last night, the idea of improvement is a subtle one, right? I mean, I'm not talking about technical improvement, but the idea that you can become a better musician over time, and at the same time, you have to just be in every moment that you're in. In that respect, life and art are the same to me. When you stop trying to be better, whatever that means to you, and it's not like a surfacey better kind of thing, then that's when I'm just going to stop. So that's, <laughs> that's the thing about making music is that you can always, there's always a, an infinite amount of stuff. You, you think you know something about music and then you experience something or hear something or play with someone that makes you realize that there's, a, there's just so much more. So... You know, I, I'm very lucky to have a lot of perspective in that, in that regard because I've been out here a while. This is a, probably a totally loaded question, and I've asked a, a small handful of bass players this question, but, you know, the, the world is actually filled with bass players, but there's a small group of bass players who work a lot that people really want to work with. I mean, you're privileged to play with some of the greatest drummers, but they choose to play with you, you know. Why do you think some bass players stand out? I think people want to play with musicians that make them feel good about what they're doing. Mm. And so uh, while it is incredibly important to be really rooted in what you're doing and have the tradition and the understanding of as much a, a tradition of jazz music and other music as we possibly can. Again, you know, constantly growing. No matter what groove it is, in whatever genre you're playing it in, make it feel good. Empathy is a big part of this. So I don't want to go too far off into the stratosphere with, with this, but empathy, but also being very rooted in what you're doing. A big part of it actually all of it, is always asking yourself in the very moment, what is the most powerful thing that I can do? Is it to lay down this groove or play this really simple walking line? Or is it to get all up in some melodic thing and get up with the soloist and play? So it, the, the question is answered differently. If you're truly open to what's happening in the moment, you know when to play those roles. And I also like music that's very rooted and then alternately very elastic. Right. Empathy, group intention, freedom from expectation, non-attachment, presence in the moment. Scott Colley demonstrated what deep thinkers these musicians are and how seriously they take their work. Yes, the music might feel good, but these people are not kidding around. The show that I saw with Scott Colley and Allison Miller, who were joined by saxophonist Dana Stevens and pianist Myra Melford, was performed for a standing audience in a tent. And the audience was into it in a, frankly, unusual way. Hooting, hollering. Like, for example, when Allison introduced her song, Speak Eddie, dedicated to her teacher, the late Eddie Marshall, and his signature five-note lick, the crowd cheered enthusiastically. And when the band moved in and out of grooving and playing free, the people applauded as if it was like a shredding guitar solo at a classic rock show. I was curious if that kind of response is typical for Allison. I just have to remark about the energy of that audience. I mean, that was yeah, like a rock and roll audience. I know. It felt like ex I was, it was exuberant. It was joyful. And I was psyched. They were so into it. I, I, I said the first thing I said to the band at, when we got off stage was, yeah. I want to play for standing audiences all the time. Well, that, that is what I thought, too. I thought outdoors, in a tent, people standing, it signals to the audience that they can rock out. I know, exactly. And it, and it signals to them that they can actually move to yeah. even music that is without pulse so much, you know? Yes. So that is the other major takeaway for me of the show, is that this band is constantly in and out of pulse. It's in and out of groove. And somehow the residual body thing is happening 
like collectively, even when we leave Pulse, that people are, were with you. Yeah, I know. It felt felt really great. How do you think about going in and out of Pulse and in and out of time and in and out of you know from free to less free? Yeah, I mean, I think about water a lot actually, and just on the drums, but then yeah. conceptually and and when I compose, I'm always thinking about um, how you know like or nature. Um, biomimicry, I don't know if you know this term, but it's about like mimicking nature, mm -hmm. basically. It's a scientific term. But I think about mimicking nature in music all the time and how, you know, nature seems like chaos and anarchy, but sometimes it, somehow it works perfectly. In fact, it works more perfect than when we try to control it, right? So I'm, that's how I approach it. And I think when you're playing with musicians you trust, like this group, we can, we can go for it. We can go in and out of time and we've got each other's back, right? So, you know, I might go out of time and Scott might stay in time, or we both might go out of time, but we trust each other so that we know we'll get back to a groove eventually. <laughs> and all of my favorite, you know, growing up, all my favorite drummers that I listened to and bands that I listened to, that's what they did as well. So it just seems normal to me. I mean, I always mention Miles' second quintet because the, the more they played together, the more they were adventurous and experimented with going in and out of time. But you always felt a pulse there, you know, with Ron on bass and Tony would go in and out of time and it was just like elastic stretching, you know. And for me, that's, that's organic and natural, yes. yeah. You're a very clear and articulate player. Your, your notes are all seem quite defined to me. So I, I hear some real intention in all of what you're playing, even when it goes out, if that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time developing clarity, so I'm happy you said that. For me, it's important. And I spend a lot of time on rudimental technique, yes. which is, and all my teachers uh, pounded that in too. <laughs> so that's, I'm glad to hear you say that. But I'm also always thinking about melodies. So for me, if I'm out of time, yeah. I still am, I'm still hearing a melody in my head and everything I do is centered around that melody. Yeah. And I can really stretch it, but it, it's always centered around a melody. I don't play anything that's like a drum lick. It's right. usually around a melody. And then the clarity comes from the fact that that's, that's the sound I want, I want and that's what I love. This music is connected to dance for me, even when it's out of time. And I feel like oftentimes jazz now is not connected with dance. And that's, I think that's a shame. It's a travesty, really. And so to have an audience that's standing there and swaying to the pulse or no pulse was really special for me. And so I'm like, yes, this is what it, this music should be. It shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't always be people sitting and being very polite and quiet. It should be people rocking out and getting into it, you know? Because that's what this music stands for, yes. you know? Yes. It doesn't stand for, like, calmness. It stands for, like, shaking things up. Walking through the festival, I encountered more than one world-class musician checking out another one's show. For example, as they made their way from the hotel to their gig, guitarist Corey Wong and his band stopped to check out saxophonist Emmanuel Wilkins' set, and I tagged along. Eventually, we found ourselves backstage at Corey's gig. His career is a kind of case study in the new model. He's self-sufficient, independent, a kind of social media wizard who makes funky, feel-good jazz-adjacent records. It's punchy Minneapolis funk with very few solos, but a lot of energy. And he's as much a content creator as he is a guitarist, which is saying a lot about both his content and his guitar playing. His early association with viral funk phenomenons Wolfpack and the Fearless Flyers put millions of eyes on him, and he seemed to know exactly what he wanted to do with the attention and how to build on it. Corey has also become an ambassador for his hometown, Minneapolis, and he's been traveling with a horn section that includes members of the Hornheads, known for their long-standing association with Prince, and Sonny T on bass, who was also a member of Prince's New Power Generation. As the horn players warmed up, the rest of us chatted casually until it was time for the pre-show huddle up. All right, everybody. Yeah. Jazz festival tonight, but it's our show. Ticket and event, Corey Wong crowd tonight. We can do whatever we want. But it's our first time here. Feels really great to have this size room and full. I don't know when the next time is we'll be back. Let's give the show of their lifetime. Let's destroy it. Hey, I don't know about you guys. I'm out for fun tonight. I'm out for fun tonight. Corey and I got together in his dressing room 
before the show to talk. Corey Wong, I just walked down the street with you here in Montreal and you are getting recognized. You're like a, <laughs> you're a celebrity now in this world. In a niche way, I get recognized. Niche crowds. It's kind of a funny thing. I mean, I think that thing has existed for a lot of years, but in particular in the last several years with the internet being what it is, there's a lot more niche communities. People really find themselves in a niche community and find some sense of identity in that. And then there are also people who are of influence in that community. And I would say that, you know, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm somewhat of that in the guitar realm, in the music nerd realm, and like in, in other things as well. So it's, I, I'm, I'm still getting used to it. You know, you speak about it as if it's something that is happening to you, but you're also a total instigator, right? I mean, you, sure. you, you are a constant <laughs> generator yeah. of content and ideas, like relentless. It actually, almost overwhelmingly so. In a lot of ways, I put out more than what would be expected. Like, I don't expect everybody who follows me to look at or listen to everything that I put out, and that's okay. It's not really a business thing to put out so much. I think it's just more of, in a lot of ways, I have this artistic energy, I have this creative energy that's happening, and as an artist, I am kind of developing in real time. And I think it's fun to show my audience what I'm exploring and listening to and how I'm growing in real time in a way that's really honest. Did you always have that energy or is it something that you're experiencing now as it rolls, you're seeing that you have more and more energy to do this right now? I've always thought that creativity is a vine that blossoms rather than a gas tank that empties. And I think once I really found my voice on the instrument and in music and a sound and a vision, that's really where it started to blossom. I certainly didn't know who I was or what I really wanted until I hit my 30s. And which is, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, oh, all right, time to hang up the spikes, you know. But in this case, it's like I really found myself then. And then I was able to lean on years of experience to help with the logistics side of getting things done yeah. and the understanding of how to. I've been a part of plenty of projects that were done responsibly and irresponsibly. So I had the experience of seeing those sometimes firsthand or secondhand or from the sideline. So by the time I was really diving into my own thing, I had some reference points that I could use or not use. I think, you know, a big part of what's happening with you is clearly happening with the guitar, with your, you know, your whole approach. People are, I mean, you've become pretty quickly a reference, which is wild. My right hand is what a lot of people will reference or my right hand thing. And in college, that was a thing that was always holding me back. It's like, oh, Corey, your right hand technique is terrible. You know, and it was for a lot of single, it's not proper technique, but it's its own thing. Yeah. So I just learned to lean into what it is that made me actually sound unique with it. Yeah. So whenever I tried to fix my technique, it was just kind of like I didn't sound like myself anymore. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to lean into the way that I feel like sounds like me. And the more I captured that, the more I've developed that and mined that into a piece of, you know, a refined whatever. It, you know, it's strange to, to hear people say to me, oh, do your Corey Wong thing on something. Yeah. And then to hear it being referenced in other sessions or like, oh, yeah, I was doing this thing and I was kind of trying to get a Corey Wong style guitar. Thing. I'm like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. That's how like, it yeah, that's so cool. But... I do think that the other piece of what's going on with you is definitely something that can be cultivated, but n not everybody's going to have it, which sure. is your persona and your personality, yeah. your showmanship, yeah. you know, your love of performance and yeah. extra musical stuff. You know, you, you are kind of an actor and a pre yeah. presenter now and a director <laughs> totally. in a way, you know, all this stuff that I guess I didn't see coming when you sure. first showed up, you know? Yeah. Just like music, just like songwriting, a lot of people think that these are either innate, you're born with perfect pitch, or you're never going to be a great musician, you know, or whatever, you know, or like, oh, this person's just born to be great at the trumpet. And it's like, well, some people have some sort of advantages. And yes, some people 
are born with some sort of innate ability, but there's a lot of time and a lot of reps and chops that go into this. And I have been performing for a lot of years and I've watched a lot of performers and paid attention. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people that are first starting to get into performing don't always pay attention to. Of course, they're paying attention to their artistry and the music and they're thinking, oh, how am I gonna talk on stage? Oh, what should I say? How should I say it? And they'll think through that, but they won't, they won't watch their own tapes of themselves doing it to look back and say, oh, that's where I'm doing this, that's where I'm doing this. Or they won't study other people who are really good at it. You know, and for me, I've studied a lot of great performers. I've watched a lot of great performers, just like I've studied great guitar players. And I've studied a lot of my own tapes and see my own things and try to, like the rule still applies on stage. We have the uhs and ums rule, where if I ever say uh or um on stage, I owe everybody in the band $10. You started to do the Wong Notes YouTube TV series, yeah. which to me is a TV show. I yeah. mean, it really is a, That's how I think of it. a yeah. traditional variety show. Exactly. How did you know that you wanted to be that guy? Yeah, I've loved variety shows and late night TV talk shows. I've been fascinated by them since I was a kid. And of course, growing up in Minnesota, there was a lot of Prairie Home Companion and that sort of thing, which is a storytelling variety show, music involved sort of thing. So a lot of those influences kind of formed me to have a curiosity and interest in being a late night band leader or something. You know, I thought, well, what would it be like if I created a show that was like a variety show or an SNL meets the late show if the band took over. Mm -hmm. That's a really fun concept. I don't think I've ever seen or heard of anybody exploring that space. It's something I've been curious about since I was a kid. So I figured I'm just going to do it. So I worked on building that show and, you know, hired a team of people to kind of help me put it all together. And it's been a wild fun thing to do and and finding some of my heroes as collaborators in the process has been really fun. As I mentioned to you, what I have been perceiving about your career and your ascent is that, you know, you're not afraid to climb a mountain and the mountains are getting bigger and bigger. Whereas initially, let's say the the riff of help me find Dave cause let's get Dave cause on a record, (laughs) you know, that turned into you know, okay, Dave Cause and I are going on tour together. Yeah. I'm on the Cause cruise. <laughs> Next thing you know, you you know, you know, have insinuated yourself in legit into smooth jazz. You actually did the thing. You infiltrated. Wild, yeah. You know? And so then, it's that's not a riff anymore. Like, mm. okay, what can we do with this? Yeah. I see you setting goals that are more and more ambitious. Yeah. I am shooting at a dartboard that has a lot of things to offer, not just one bullseye. And when I hit a lot of those, I can actually then all of a sudden open up other things and see what's almost behind there and try to aim for even a dartboard that's farther away or something. I don't know where the analogy ends. But (laughs) um, with with right in front of me, I can see this dartboard where it's like, okay, I want to get involved in this sort of thing. I want to have this sort of font size on these types of festivals. I want to be able to sell out these kind of rooms in these kind of cities. I want to have this kind of numbers on my videos and whatever. And there's there's different targets there that are not necessarily a specific numbers-driven thing, but are just kind of, okay, this is generally where I'd like to see this go. And I don't always tie objective marks to my goals because sometimes you'll hit them and then see that there actually wasn't a lot of fulfillment in that. And actually a lot of the process gets me there. So it's very cliche, but the journey being, you know, the thing that's more than the destination. And I think, you know, for me right now, there's kind of solving the riddle of being an ambassador for instrumental music and kind of finding the space of being a, an instrumentalist in the pop zeitgeist like a Santana mm-hmm. or like a, a Herbie Hancock even, you know, there's, there was mm-hmm. a time where there were some instrumental songs on the radio. Mm-hmm. Like, what would it take to get 
an instrumental tune on the radio. Mm -hmm. Along the way, I don't want to sacrifice any of my own artistic vision or integrity with it. It's just, okay, I'm doing these things that could fall Mm. in line with shooting at this place on a dartboard. Do I want to go for that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that still falls directly in line. And then maybe I'll try it. Thanks, Corey. Thanks for having me. great to see you again, Always great to see you. Wonderful to be at the Montreal Jazz Festival. About to get it in here. While Corey Wong is shooting at a dartboard and playing by the new rules of social media, YouTube, and content creation, pianist Aaron Goldberg has a more reticent relationship with the modern model. He played a late-night set with Yes Trio, the group he co-leads with the drummer Ali Jackson and bassist Omer Avital. They played to a densely packed room. Aaron has been a highly regarded sideman, collaborator, co-leader, and solo artist for years, and I wanted to talk to him about how he thinks about a career in jazz today. And man, he did not disappoint. Aaron is serious about what he does. He's incredibly thoughtful, sees his decisions both online and on stage as political statements as well as artistic. We strolled through Montreal chatting and getting lost, both in conversation and in the city itself. Aaron so Goldberg, walk, yeah. like this, why, walk and talk, why, why not? not? We're why walking not? and talking. Aaron Goldberg, I'm so happy to be walking and talking with you in Montreal right now. I went to go hear you play last night with the Yes Trio, and I was amazed by the enthusiasm and intensity of the audience. Like, you, they were really there for you. you I mean, you guys were killing it, but the room was hot. Yeah, one thing I've discovered playing in this band at this particular moment in jazz history <laughs> is that uh, there is an appetite for, you know, the, the way that we approach this music. And I, I think that that's a kind of, um, I'm discovering that it's actually more unique than I realized. And it, it has something to do with the, the fact that we all definitely come from the center of the tradition. You know, we, we have a deep love for swinging music and for bebop, but we also have, you know, our, our particular take on on how jazz music should make the audience feel and should make us feel. So we have, you know, we have a super long history of 30 years of playing together, and we have a, a shared sense of humor, yeah. um, and a shared sense of like what's fun on the bandstand, yeah. and <laughs> and a shared sense of like what's soulful on the bandstand, and a shared sense of, um, you know good and bad taste you know maybe we push we push the borders <laughs> we try we uh we we take a fair amount of risk but you know so we have a a, a somewhat maybe you could say like postmodern attitude but but the the actual content of the musical content of the music is coming straight out of the center of the tradition so so in so, you know it makes people tap their feet shake their booty bop their head and smile it's serious music but with a little bit of a irreverent attitude irreverence the wrong word because we're reverent towards jazz <laughs> but 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 we're we're not classicists and we're we're not trying to stick within any kind of like a preconceived notion of you know what this music is about we're basically just speaking our truth finding our our integrity as individuals and as a trio and being ourselves and 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 we're just having a lot of fun up there and, that, and I think that the fun is the element that you know, brings the audience on stage with us, you know, not, not just like smiling in a, in, a, in a classicist kind of way that you might find it Jazz and Lincoln Center, but like actually in the band. It, feel, it always feels like the audience is in the band with us. And that is, that is kind of unique to this, this trio. What a thoughtful answer, man. And also uh, an answer loaded with ideas. I mean, I guess the first one is to say at this moment in the history of this music, that there's a hunger and an appetite for that, to feel good, to just experience that essential, universal feeling of enjoyment. Yeah, I mean, jazz started as dance music. I mean, it was sw- swing music, <laughs> swing orchestras were there to inspire people to make love <laughs> and to feel good. <laughs> Something you would do at the end of a hard work week, you know, you'd go dancing. This music, although it's, it's high art music, you know, the great icons of this music are some of the you know, greatest creative musicians that the world has ever seen, the planet has ever hosted. Uh, and we're all about that. We're all about playing a bunch of badass solos in the moment <laughs> and, and trying to be 
you know, creative improvisers um, together, right? So it's it's the high, it's the art, as Ali said, like I got a new concept. It's called listening. <laughs> you know, it's the art of imp- improvising together, responding to what everyone else is, is doing in the moment while you're, you're you know you're speaking your own truth in your solo. You know, the context for every solo is is, is a kind of empathy amongst the trio. So every individual solo is in a certain respect also like a group is a collaboration you know a group solo and we we're all about supporting each other my point is really just that we haven't forgotten and we love the fact and we are reverent towards the fact that this music is supposed to make you move and groove and and feel good and smile and open your heart and have hope uh and you know this is the blues tradition it's it's there's a lot of things to be sad about <laughs> mm-hmm. in, in today's world. Yeah, but there's also that old expression, the blues hurts so nice, you know? It, exactly. So that's that's what this music has always been about for us. And, and I think, you know, the, the greatest practitioners of this music in all styles have never forgotten that, right? So the, the rhythmic part of it, the dancing part of it, that's the African part of it. You know, I think you have had, in some ways, a complicated career because you are such a great collaborator and such a great contributor to other people's projects. And that I wonder if there's a solo career for you that hasn't happened. Yeah, I think think I've always made it an effort to do both things at the same time. Yeah. Actually, I would say all three things, meaning play in other people's bands whose music I love, you know, work with band leaders that I admire. I enjoy the challenge of being part of a musical project that is really not about me. You know, it's about, <laughs> it's not, ideally not even about the band leader either. It's, a, it's about some, the music itself, which is music that I believe in. I have to believe in that music and find it beautiful in order to, you know, give my full self to it. There's an art to being a pianist isn't, it's a high art, a pianist working as a sideman in other people's bands, being yourself and yet giving this particular person's music what it needs. And then the second thing I would say is I, I've been interested in collaborating in co-led bands, which is a, a different kind of challenge, right? Different kind of social challenge, different kind of aesthetic challenge, because you really have to combine concepts yes. or find the common ground. In a good collaborative project right in a good co-led band there's not that much you have to talk about when you have to talk about stuff that can be a sign that there's some kind of conceptual clash that will eventually lead to the dissolution of the band and then of course the third thing is being a band leader myself that is partly our like a compositional um, role it's a composing and arranging role it's also this big philosophical aesthetic question of like what is my music what I want my music to sound like what is my particular take on the tradition the future um, and what is my role in pushing this music in particular directions those kind of questions and also how do I lead a band how do I bring out the best in the in the people that are working with me how do I choose the cats I want to work with and how do I keep a band together and, and working right so that last one is a professional challenge, right? So it's a, it's a challenge that has a lot to do with the industry. And these days it has to do with a lot to do with how you play a particular kind of game, which is a new game that I didn't grow up with, which has to do with internet and social media and, you know, marketing and, you know, the role of the artist in self-promotion, which is not something that I ever saw as part of my future as a jazz musician when I was coming up. I also never wanted to be a businessman of any kind, right? I, I had zero interest in having a business. It, you could so, almost argue that but choosing to be a musician was a rejection of correct, living it, in the world of, of business. Of course, I was naive, right? So yeah. one reason why your question is apropos and, and observant, and I'm, I'm honored that you have even you know <laughs> cared about this issue, yeah. uh, <laughs> is, is that I've, I've always had a reticent relationship with this truth that I yeah. just spoke, right? Yes. It's something that I've forced myself to accept at many times in my career, but also like felt the need to step away from at various times in my career for personal reasons, philosophical reasons, political reasons. I've been struggling with this issue in general. I mean, we all struggle as human beings and 
and citizens, world citizens and American citizens, with this issue of like, how revolutionary do we want to be? And if, if we're not revolutionary, what are we complicit in? And if we are revolutionary, are we actually effective? So this is related to anyone's professional career. There's a lot of small compromises that anybody in any profession has to do to survive in that profession. And those small compromises have, and some, sometimes maybe even large compromises, have shifted over the years since I entered this music. You know, I know that you are a political person on some level, that you see that there is value in advocacy. And, and so when I hear you say, look, it's a political statement to prioritize a co-led band because it takes the priority away from the, the one and it puts it on the group. That, that's a political thing to do. That's true. And, and the, the music that makes me happy always has, at least musically, foregrounded that. It's not about me. Great music has never, in my opinion, ever been about me, so to speak. It's always about how you fit into this larger sound world, how, how your sound contribution fits into a larger sound world. That, that is way beyond the self. There's something deep and mysterious and magical about being a human. Why are we moved by certain music? Yeah, I'm, I'm all about prioritizing that. And do we have a choice but to be political? Like, I think we, if, we, if we give up on political engagement, then we give up the right to complain about anything because you know, we live in a society that is our responsibility to create and to make better, and we all have to do our little part, and just complaining is not a, does not count as a, as a part. You have to complain and then try to do something to fix the things you're complaining about. So yeah, I do, I do absolutely believe in that. Aaron Goldberg, what a treat. Thanks, man. I don't know where we got to, but we, <laughs> I feel like we've been somewhere. We've been somewhere, we wandered. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. If we're not revolutionary, what are we complicit in? Well, Kamasi Washington certainly paints a revolutionary picture in his stage presentation. Everyone in the band has a powerful image, and Kamasi himself seems to suggest a deep intention to express something radical, even if it's not entirely clear what it is. Saturday night at the festival, he played for a crowd of thousands, maybe even tens of thousands, on the big stage. He prefaced his song, Sun-Kissed Child, by explaining that it was about the love he felt when he held his newborn daughter for the first time. And although that much was clear, and the song was evocative, some audience members were left wondering what it was meant to evoke. I watched the show with two guys who referred to themselves as the jazz jeweler in town from Atlanta, and the crypto king, who preferred not to divulge where he was from exactly. I asked the jazz jeweler what he made of Washington's bespoke rings. Jazz jeweler, when you see Kamasi Washington's rings, what do you, what do you see? I see exceptional individuality. I see a story in each one of those pieces that I want to understand. I want to know. I want to know what each of those means. I mean, each of those, it was selected for sure because of some story. Are they, are they custom, do you think? They're unusual pieces, for right? For sure. They're very unusual. Um, but I think each one of them really has meaning to Kamasi, each one of them. I don't know what the story is, but I think that's like a whole, that's a whole show. You could do a whole third story about that. Yeah, but you know, we don't know what the story is really in the music either. I mean, in this case, he explained this is the song about his child, but the, the truth is we're left to interpret what is it supposed to mean when we hear the melodies. So I, I think sometimes it's better not even to know the truth, just to imagine. I get it. I like that. I, I mean, I feel, I feel that what I can say about the entire stage tonight, for Kamasi specifically, is that everyone is expressing their own individual uh, style, their own flair. I mean, you, obviously, you look at the bass, you see somebody that's saying something. You look at Kamasi, he's saying something with his outfit, his intense eyes. His jewelry is special, and uh, I think you could take that a little deeper because I'm pretty sure, as we're listening, this song is about the love of a newborn baby. So what I'm thinking is, everything he does keeps us guessing. So what I think is that this song is the opposite of what he felt. I think this is what his wife felt during birth. 
I think this is what happened as the baby was emerging into the world, coming down the birth canal, episiotomy situation. Mm. Oh, and now the relief. This is the baby. Now this is the baby. This is the love. This is the now beauty. This is the, ba this is the baby. Yeah, this is the baby. Yes. There it is. So, so that's why I think that the jewelry is not going to be a straightforward situation. I think that this this world that is created up there is like Leo. You said it's left to the imagination. It needs to be interpreted. And but I think everything is specific. Everything has a place and everything has a meaning. And maybe it is for us to interpret. After five days of wandering in Montreal, five days of interpreting, my ears, I admit, were ringing a bit. My mind was racing, but my heart was full. My dad likes to say that jazz musicians are just like everyone else, only more so. And I think these conversations and these interactions support that thesis. I came to find a story, and I found an almost infinite well of stories. At every turn, there was another one. Self-expression, politics, social media, technology, conservationism were all part of the fabric, but the common thread, I think, between all of them was one of empathy and communion, building community one set at a time. This music, as so many of the musicians refer to it, represents human potential. And humans are complicated beings, filled with all kinds of potential. But at our core, we're social beings. The singer Gregory Porter brought it home for me this way. The whole thing that's involved is, you know, communing with the audience and having, you know, conversations with other musicians and, you know, just a, a slice of normal life. Yeah. Uh, at least <laughs> the, the abnormal life that is normal for, for musicians, traveling musicians. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to a summer of, you know, hopefully elevating people's... Uh, feelings and emotions uh, about life and music so yeah I don't think anybody gets into being a musician you know only for the technical aspects of it it's, it's you, you there's something there's emotion there there's something that feels good there's there's you know there's a whole lot of things just therapy both for the audience and for the performer without it um, there was definitely some something missing definitely in my life for sure so to get back to it is, is uh, I, you know, I kind of, I feel whole again, really. Mm -hmm. The transformation that I see in the audience is that right now they're quite hungry for, yes. for music and to move and to be together. Yeah. We are social beings and, and music is, uh, is a social lubricant. And so, you know, very important for people. The third story is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Leo Sidrin. And it's a collaboration with WBGO Studios. Visit wbgo.org slash studios for more information about their award-winning content. Thanks to Nate Chenen, Steve Williams, Stephen Smith, Doug Doyle, and the rest of the WBGO team who supported me through this experience. And thanks to my father, Ben, as well. He knows why. And thanks to you for listening. I'll be back in your headspace with another deep dive before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios' award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org studios.